Welcome back to my Warhammer lore. In today's video, we will be delving back into the Lizardmen, but this time, however, we will be focusing on their military, starting with their command structure, units, and tactics, and of course, this will be related back to Total War Warhammer as well. I do want to briefly mention that I am hosting a Q&A session tomorrow. If you want to submit any questions, I will have a link to my previous video in which you can leave your questions in the comment section. And enough of that, let's get into the lore. Since the days of their creation, the Lizardmen have been at the forefront of the battle for the world's survival. Their armies are anchored by savage warriors spawned for the sole purpose of war and augmented with titanic reptilian beasts whose tread shakes the earth. Their enigmatic leaders are powerful wizards and wield magics beyond the kin of mere mortals. From deep within the steaming jungles of Lustria, the Lizardmen sound the drums of war while gargantuan creatures from a primordial past bellow their blood rage. From temple cities and overgrown ruins, they issue forth to defend their ancient civilization or to unleash their cold-blooded savagery upon the world. Merciless and relentless, the Lizardmen will not stop until all their foes are dead and the entire world reordered according to their ancient plan. A Lizardman host deployed for battle is as formidable as sight. A screen of nimble skirmishers spreads out first, followed by rank after rank of merciless warriors. They are guided by the mightiest of mages, and their war leaders are battle-scarred veterans who will fight to the bitter end. In the air above, winged beasts screech while out of the jungle stomp hulking reptilian monsters, pitiless, savage creatures of an elder age. Yet the Lizardmen do not war for plunder or territory, but instead fight for a higher cause a world order laid out ages ago by the long-lost Cosmic Masters. In times of war, Temple City often has a standing army to protect it from harm or to march out and eliminate their foes on the field of battle. The Saras typically formed the core of the Lizardmen armies, for the sole purpose in life was to be trained as powerful and fearless warriors. Alongside these mighty reptiles, cohorts of skinks are often called upon to aid the army as a force of dedicated scouts and skirmishers able to navigate the lush jungles of Lustria with extreme ease. Alongside these small skinks come the massive Croxagores, who are often given the duty of hauling equipment and heavy machinery or sent into the fray as powerful shock infantry. Yet it isn't these mighty warriors that truly evokes fear upon the enemies, but rather the mighty reptilian beasts that fight alongside them. From mighty Carnosaurs to hulking Stegodons, the massive reptilian monsters have proven themselves time and time again as powerful allies for the Lizardmen's cause. Yet even above these mighty beasts comes the true power of the Lizardmen. From above the fighting, the mystical Slan unleashed magics so powerful that it is likened to that of the gods. Hurling powerful lightning storms or massive meteorites against their enemies with an ease that belie imagination. The Slan are truly intelligent beyond mortal comprehension able to foresee the outcome of a battle long before it has ever begun. It is said that so long as a slan leads them on their campaign, the Lizardmen cohorts are reassured of ultimate and glorious victory time and time again. Now this has been a brief overview of what the Lizard Army looks like, but let's get into the individual units starting with their leaders of said army. And we might as well start off big with the slan mage priests. The Slan form one of the core species of the Lizardman race, created by the Old Ones to be the leaders, organizers, architects, and techno-mages of their society, perhaps the backbone of their culture. Being one of the most magically powerful races on the face of the Warhammer world, these favorite servants of the Old Ones have considerable intellect and magical abilities beyond the kin of most mortal races, and rule the Lizardmen as a venerated caste of semi-religious magic users. Although not physically menacing, their bodies are toad-like with large heads and bulbous eyes. With a flick of their multi-jointed fingers, Slan can topple cities, engulf foes in flames, or open vast vents into the ground below. Enemy wizards find even the mightiest incantations they try to employ unraveling before them as a Slan contemptuously waves its hands. There were five spawnings of Slan created by the Old Ones, each with a particular role to play in the Great Plan. No new Slan has been spawned since the departure of their creators. All the slan alive today are those same ones. Without any new mage priests to pass the torch to their generation, they are a dying race, faced with extinction. Well over half of their kind died in the great catastrophe, including all of the first spawning, the wisest and most powerful of the slan, and the only ones that had direct contact with the old ones. In the ages since then, many other slan have died violently, irrevocably losses that are greatly lamented. 
With each mage priest lost, the Soros and Skinks further insulate those that remain, protecting them with their very lives. As you can see, the Slant are rather sacred overlords, but there is more to them than just that. You see, the Slants see the world differently from other beings. Their orderly minds are constantly at work, deciphering complex problems and wandering the cosmos. To the Slan, time passes more quickly than it does for short-lived creatures. And a Slan will regularly slip into extended periods of restful contemplation that might last decades or even centuries at a time. They sit, unmoving, on their stone palaquins or in their star chambers. And to an outsider, the Slan might appear asleep or even dead. So deeply do they meditate that signs of life are hard to detect. Their breaths are shallow and fall apart, their eyes unblinking and vacant, yet the Slan are attuned to more than mortals realize, for they can perceive the magic and raw disorder that has hung in the very air since the great influx of chaos. So it is that the Slan are the last of a dying race, and even the youngest is over 7,000 years old. Their numbers are slowly dwindling, never to be replaced. They are very rarely slain in combat, but they will usually magically teleport themselves out of danger before a killing blow is landed. The husk bodies of those who are somehow killed are mummified and entombed beneath the temple cities, and they are venerated as much as they were in life. However, so strong is the consciousness that these slain are able to hold their spirits in this world. Even when their physical bodies are slain, they are still able to influence the world through their arcane powers, as well as communicating with their living slain brethren, and appearing to the skink priests in visions and dreams. Now, the slant of the first spawning died many thousand years ago, and their mummified corpses are venerated as holy relics. So strong is their spirit that they can still affect the world around them, manipulating the winds of magic and advising the younger slant. It is believed that only five slant of the second spawning remain, ruling the greatest temple cities in Lustria. They are the most powerful of these creatures left in existence, and the ones who spend the most time in meditative states. The third, fourth, and fifth spawnings of Slan are more common than their ancient forebears, and yet are still immeasurably ancient beings that can remember a time before elf or dwarf history began. Some of these younger Slan have been known to shift their weight on occasion, though such occurrences are monumentous and rare, and in these younger generations who are more inclined to warfare and aggression, as the Slan have begun to get more agitated by the pressing concern of the spread of chaos, so they too have become more active in the world. Their armies have been mustering, and even the most ancient Slan has readied himself to war. In battle, a Slan hovering platform gently glides forward, borne aloft by ancient magics and the will of the Slan himself, surrounded by devoted Saurus warriors. From his reclining position, the Slan gestures with the multi-fingered joints, unleashing devastating magic against all who defy him. The Slan know that they were entrusted with the task of maintaining and completing the grand design of the Old Ones. The known world is but a small element in this awesome universal plan. Privileged skinks attend to the Slan, patiently waiting for the ancient beings to stir and recording their every prophecy or proclamation. Most often, however, Slan converse telepathically between themselves. They can also see through the eyes of some skinks, such as the priests or oracles, and enact their will throughout them. Although they have lost much of their former power since the incursion of the Dark Gods into the world, the Slan are still the undisputed masters of the magical arts. Now, the Slan were never truly meant nor created to be natural-born warriors, for the body of a Slan is frail, bloated, and slow-moving. It is not their physical form which terrifies their enemies. Instead, the Slan are considered the most powerful magic users on the face of the Earth. With but a flick of their finger, they could incinerate whole companies of warriors, and with a wave of a hand, they could topple entire cities or move mountains. During the Great Catastrophe, the world was contaminated. Since then, Slan have avoided setting even a single toe upon the earth, for this grounds their magical power and disrupts their thoughts. While ensconced in their pyramid temples, Slan are protected, but when forced to leave, they sit upon floating palaquins made of stone and other unknown substances. A slant controls his slab's thrown movement with his mind, hovering motionless or moving at a respectable pace, and it shimmers with a powerful protective force field. Now, when it comes to leading an army, these slant are excellent generals. They can easily relay information to their troops instantly through telepathy, as well as see the battlefield unfolding through the eyes of their followers if they wish making him probably the single most informed general 
in the Warhammer world, outside of probably necromancers and certain chaos entities. Of course, in the lore, they also can see the future. So when a slan usually commands an army, unless the odds are simply abysmal, they tend to come out on top. In addition to this, they are by far the most powerful casters in the Warhammer world, rivaled by very, very few individuals, and maybe the, even the Lords of Change. This is very much reflected in the Total War Warhammer adaptation, and that the Slan have access to a variety of spells from various lores. Unfortunately, you can't pick your spells, but you do get a sense that if you play a campaign, they are sacred in that you have to perform a rite to even be allowed to recruit one to lead your army. And we have gone on about Slan for quite a few, quite a while at this point, so I apologize for that. And we will move on to the Saros Old Blood. Sorry about that, guys. You know I get distracted occasionally, even with my script. <laughs> so, back to the Saros Old Blood. The Saros Old Bloods are amongst the oldest and most powerful living warriors within the Lizardman Empire of Lestria, ancient beings who have been alive for several thousand years. Though slow to react, these mighty reptilian warriors are not dull-witted or simple. Quite the contrary. They know just about everything there is to know about fighting, and often care little for anything else. Since it has never been known for a Saurus to die of old age, the longer, the longer a Saurus lives, the tougher and more ferocious he becomes. Their scales become thicker and harder, and their sheer presence encourages the younger lizardmen to greater acts of savagery. Many old bloods bear markings on their bodies which help to indicate one or more of the inscrutable lizardmen gods that favor them. These markings may be a subtle change in hue of their crest or more obvious signs, such as a pale or even albino tone. The most favored are destined to become mighty heroes and leaders in their own armies. Due to their ancient status, old bloods are often attended to by scores of skinks so that their every thought can be directed towards the impending battle. These servants will secure bronze armor plates and otherwise help prepare them for battle. The skinks will often dab war paint and adorn the sars with oils, precious metals, and the shrunken heads of sacrificed foes and other such grisly trophies. This not only marks his status or rank, but also serves to warn the enemy that the vengeance of the Old Ones, made manifest in over eight feet of savage reptilian muscle, has come for them. These sars are without mercy, and capable of slaughtering entire regiments with terrifying acts of savagery. With lethal efficiency, these cold-blooded killers dispatch their foes, each and every movement a killing stroke. There is no finesse to the massacre. The enemy is simply torn apart, limb by limb. When a source leads an army to battle, only the greatest of heroes and warriors could ever hope to stop this ancient warrior from achieving ultimate and glorious victory. Now, you would think that the slan would be the penultimate general for the Lizardmen, but in my opinion, the Old Bloods are more suited for the task, as it seems to be what they are bred for. They understand their troops in a way the Slan cannot, and therefore, through the extensive battle-hardened history, become excellent tacticians, and are said to possess a bestial cunning for war. Of course, these are your standard melee general in Total War, and can also be mounted on a cold one and even a mighty Carnosaur. And that is it for the generals that lead the Lizardmen army. So let's delve into the heroes. And we start with the Skink Priest. So the Skink Priests are the most intelligent of their skittish kind, whose role within their society are to act as religious figures, magic users, and important emissaries for their mighty slam. On occasion, a Skink spawning will not produce an entire cohort from the pools of life, as is the norm. But instead, only a single Skink will issue forth. These individuals are marked by the old ones and destined to lead, or otherwise achieve greatness amongst their kind. Skink priests are the only ones capable of interpreting and executing the will of their slan masters. This is rarely straightforward, as entranced slan do not do little more than mumble, yet each utterance, even the most incoherent whisper, might have vast consequences for all living creatures. The slan are the most powerful of mages, and they alone worked under orders from the old ones, and it is strictly forbidden to disturb an entranced slan in any but the direst of times. It is left to a skink priest to make many daily decisions for the whole of Lizardman society on behalf of their masters. It is their role to ensure that the great plan comes to fruition. Slan are slow to react and may contemplate a single decision for centuries at a time. The same cannot be said for the skinks for they are impatient beings. Like the Slan, Skink priests study the ancient writings, though they apply much less of the studious 
methodology that their venerated leaders use, Skink priests often see it as acceptable to be to take a more proactive role in ensuring that the prophecies of the sacred plaques come true. The slan, should they notice such activities, find such impulses to be reckless and attempt to censor their skink priests, putting a temporary halt to such practices as living sacrifices, the undue veneration of active volcanoes, and any number of new ritual blessings designed by the skink priests to attract the old one's attention. Now you can see also why the prophet of Sotek is such a notorious figure amongst the slan, as he literally embodies, or at least seems to embody, all the qualities the slan find unpleasant about their intendants. Of course we do have skink priests as a caster hero and warhammer, with access to the lore of beasts and heavens, making them a much more supportive caster with a few damage dealing spells, and overall fairly good mages as they can be mounted on a pterodon for speed, or a stegodon which makes them unbelievably hardy as well as a mobile artillery piece. Now, Skink Chiefs are the leaders of Skink Society, and second only in command to the Skink Priests. In the Lizardman Chain of Command, Skink Priests direct their orders to Skink Chiefs. These are Skinks who have been marked for greatness. While the Priests attend to prophecies, it is left to the Skink Chiefs to execute orders. It is they who typically oversee patrols, major construction projects, and the messenger system. They are aggressive by Skink standards, sometimes riding to battle atop pterodons. It is not their role to sacrifice themselves in battle, but rather to spy out intruders, alert the Saras, and then guide them towards their foe. It is they who interpret the complicated instructions, often passed from Slan Mage Priest to Skink Priest, and finally to themselves. Then in turn, it is they who give orders to the Saras and the cold-blooded behemoths that make up the bulk of the Lizardman armies. We also have the Skink Chiefs in-game, and they can be mounted on Pterodons and a Stegodon. They fill the role of almost a ranged assassin, but when mounted on a Stegodon, they tend to be a wrecking ball, but still have more of a supportive role. And that leads us to our final hero in the Scarred Veteran. The Saras Scar Veteran, also known simply as the Saras Leader, are the most powerful of their savage kind. More than simply 8 feet of savage reptilian muscle, Scarred Veterans are perfectly designed killing machines. Their martial prowess, further enhanced by battle experience to their foes, be they ancient nemesis or simply those who trespass upon their sovereign territory of their masters, Saurus leaders are nothing less than the vengeance of the Old Ones made manifest. Only the mighty Old Bloods are even above these mighty warriors, for they are far more ancient and powerful beyond mortal reckoning. Some Saurus leaders are marked for greatness as they are spawning bearing a different pattern or crest to the rest of their brethren, though few of those who emerge with pale or albinal skin tones are always revered, for they are the favorite of the Old Ones and destined to become mighty heroes of the Lizardmen. Yet Isaurus needs not be different from his comrades to gain veteran status, he needs only to survive. All Saurus warriors are spawned with the knowledge of how to fight, the longer each lives the more battles he survives. The longer he survives, the more he understands the needs not just of a lone warrior, but also of an entire army. While a Scar veteran cannot explain the meaning of a refused flank, he will know how to launch such a maneuver. A Saur Scar veteran could not express why he chose a defensive in depth to defeat a foe. Yet he will inexasperately recognize that such situations are called for and react accordingly. With only a low grumbling growl and a final bellow, a Scar Veteran can set an entire Lizardman battle line in order. Once comba combat begins, the Scar Veterans hurl themselves into the fray with merciless efficiency. Each stroke, a bite, or thrust dispatches a foe, often with the enemy literally torn limb from limb by the ferocity of the attack, very similar to the Old Blood we covered earlier. The Scar Veteran is our final hero and also made the cut for Warhammer as the primary melee hero, capable of being mounted on a cold one or a Carnosaur. They also train your troops similar to an Empire Captain and of course are excellent for tying down units or supporting your infantry. And now we move on to the standard infantry. By now I would think that you have an understanding of what a Saurus is, and if you want more detail you should check out my previous society video, which I guess I will link in the description now. Now, Saurus are brutish, yet disciplined creatures. Even unarmed, they are extremely dangerous. Their sharp claws can gouge groves in a rock or tear at a foe's throat with ease. Their muscular tails can smash a man's ribcage, and their mouths are full of enormous dagger-shaped teeth. 
The power of the crocodilian jaws is such that a vicious saurus bite can sever a limb or crush steel. If not killed outright, those bitten by a saurus bear infected wounds, often succumbing to a foul fever and dying within a matter of days. Although unable to master more complicated devices, saurus use simple weapons to devastating effect wielding obstinate tipped spears and heavy clubs spiked with jagged stones. Using their great strength, Saurus can leave the roads and hack through the dense jungle of Lustria using brute force alone. However, they're more accustomed to exerting it against their, their foe's stoutest legion. Although they can at times appear slow of reflex and sluggish, Saurus can still achieve speed on the march thanks to the power of their loping gait. Their tough hides, bare spines, bony crests, and thick scales that can turn aside all but the sheriff of sword strokes. For further defense, Saurus will at times bear shields, bladed crescents made from the cured hides of the large-scaled beasts that prowl the deepest jungles. Saurus are cold-blooded and seemingly impervious to pain, able to sustain horrific wounds and fight on without making a single sound or protest. Indeed, so alien are they that they register no emotion save a single-minded savagery. Now, the Saurus we get in Warhammer come in four varieties. You have the standard warriors with essentially cudgels and the warriors with spears. Then you get a shield variant of each, which has identical stacks except for now they have a shield block incoming missiles. The spears are good for anti-large, so cavalry and monsters, and the cudgels are good for everything else. They are fantastic and rather expensive standard infantry, but can even sometimes hold their own against elite infantry from other factions which cost significantly more than themselves. On to the Skinks, which form one of the core species of the Lizardman race, created by the Old Ones to be the workers, artisans, and crafters of their society. Skittish and quick, Skinks stand out from the rest of the sluggish Lizardmen in terms of mental capacity. They are the mass workforce designed by the Old Ones to perform many different roles that requires a quick mind and a dexterous hand to operate. And without them, Lizardman society would simply collapse. Skinks are highly organized and sociable beings that instinctively work well in groups, even being able to coerce other cold-blooded creatures into doing their bidding. Both physically and mentally agile, skinks are perfectly adept to ensure the smooth day-to-day -day running of the temple cities, as well as operating the far-ranging patrols that sweep across the vast jungle continent. Of all the lizardmen, the skinks are the most communicative, using their changeable skin tones and crest colors to add subtle inferences to their vocal language, in which they chitter endlessly in a high-pitched voices full of clicks, hisses, and other curious sounds. Skinks take up weapons during their many patrols, as well as to join the fighting during times of war. As troops, they range between reckless audacity and sudden panic. Their skittish nature makes them much more prone to fleeing than the Stoic Saurus. They are typically used in two different types of formations. Most commonly, the skinks advance before the bulk of the main army, harassing the foe, advance with a hail of darts, and when massed together in a fighting cohort, the skinks can bulk out a lizardman battle line. This fighting formation becomes considerably more effective when led by a skink brave or a skink chief, or when augmented with a number of the enormous croxagore. However, the volleys of javelins and darts that the skinks can unleash are astoundingly dangerous, for they have learned to coat their weapons with lethal toxins distilled from the venomous amphibians, insects and serpents that thrive in the streamy jungle and profuse swamps of Lustria. Employing their natural affinity with, for, with water, skinks look for opportunities to attack their foes from unexpected quarters. Many an army has been outflanked by skinks who navigated what was thought to be an impassable swamp or river. Now that last bit is important in that in tabletop, skinks have the aquatic rule which allows them to cross through rivers and lakes unhindered and can even hide in them to outskirmish a superior enemy because they get a massive buff to the chance the enemy will shoot and miss them as they are submerged in the water and simply pop up only quickly enough to shoot their little darts or throw their javelins. Now unfortunately, they don't have quite the same capability in total war. Now they are not hindered by any of the penalties for fighting in the martial water, but then again, they aren't very good melee combatants to begin with, so it is almost a useless perk, in my opinion at least. Now, skinks come in several different varieties in Total War. We have Standard Skink Cohort with Shields, who kind of function as a quick light flanker and ranged hunter, but they should not engage regular troops as they are very, very squishy indeed, and do not fare well against Standard Infantry. Then we have the Skink Cohort with Javelins, which do decent damage but have a very limited ammunition and range. 
Now, then we have the last, which is the skin cohort with blowpipes, which they do poison damage, which is very good and helps support your troops, but they have almost no armor piercing value whatsoever and also suffer from a limited range, making them rather poor skirmishers unless you can flank an enemy with them. And then we have the chameleon skinks, which are a subspecies of skink that have a number of peculiarities that distinguish them from the others of their own kind. The chameleons are much more aggressive than the other skinks, and their role centers around scouting, infiltration, concealment, and hunting. They stalk their prey through the jungles, whether that prey be food or intruder, and are able to move to within yards of the target without being seen. This is chiefly due to their chameleonic skin that can shift in texture and color in a heartbeat to match the surroundings almost perfectly. Chameleon skinks have large protruding eyes that can move independently, allowing them to see everything around while still remaining perfectly motionless. Chameleon skinks do not dwell within the temple cities, but instead strike out deep into the lustrian jungles. Some spawnings roam in groups across the land, while others instinctively guard a home territory. Most often a neglected monument long lost to the jungle, from there, they join skink patrols and stalk rogue beasts when they inadvertently enter sacred ground. Chameleon skinks are an unusual spawning that for many ages was thought to have become extinct. The, they originated exclusively from the sacred spawning pools of Pahuax, the temple city destroyed soon after the fall of the Polar Gates, and it was thought that the last of their kind was slain in the Battle of Blood Ravine. However, beginning in the Age of Strife, a few haphazard spawnings occurred across Lustria, and in recent years, they have proliferated at rates never before seen. The fact that they have spontaneously begun to spawn again has been interpreted in many different ways by the skink priests. It is assumed to be a part of the Old One's great plan, but whether the proliferation is due to the growing chaos threat, or because the Old Ones deemed that communion skinks would be needed for the Lizardmen to once more expand their realm, is mere speculation. With skin able to mimic the patterns of their surrounding environment, chameleon skinks are able to sneak within a few arm's length of their enemies. Chameleon skinks are exceptionally accurate, able to fire with unerring precision. They are aided by their large, protruding eyes which give them means to focus on two different things independently and to achieve all-around sight without moving their heads. A vital ability for a creature that stands completely still in order to blend in with its environment. Last but not least, chameleon skinks' eyes have a telescopic ability enabling them to zoom their focus upon a target. Even heavily armored foes are not safe, as the chameleon skinks can aim at more vulnerable joints or thread a shot straight through a minuscule vision slit. And as you can see, the chameleon skinks are the elite skirmishers of the Lizardmen, and for the most part, this is translated over fairly well to Total War. Now, I have found the skinks in general to be lacking, but the chameleon skinks do fare better, as they have camouflage, and a special rule that makes them highly resistant to retaliatory missile damage, meaning that they can be used even in their very limited range to outskirmish superior units, and their stealth allows them to close the gap without taking too much damage before getting into striking distance. Now on to the Temple Guard, which are a revered and uncommon spawning of Saurus. They were created to protect the Slain Mage Priests and the Temple Cities in which the Lizardmen dwell. To their tasks, they dedicate every fiber of their being, displaying a single-minded determination that result in either the safeguarding of their charges or their own deaths. As befits their honored status, Temple Guards are armed with heavy ornamental halberds and adorned with sacred glyphs. In addition to armor plates of the strongest bronze, the Temple Guard bear distinctive helms fashioned from the horned and crested skulls of lustrous predatory beasts. Some Temple Guard are as old as the Temple Cities and slain that they protect. However, should one fall in battle, his helm is salvaged by skink attendants to be placed within the inner sanctum of a pyramid temple. There it remains, a relic, until a new generation of temple guards spawn to claim the helm of the fallen. It is believed that when Asaurus inherits one of these sacred heirlooms, he becomes imbued with a portion of its predecessor's strength and martial skill. In this way, the temple guard continue to safeguard their charges for eternity, clearly the role for which they were designed. As protectors, Temple guards are matchless. They stand sentry, silent and motionless, not even blinking their eyes. It has been known for Temple Guard to maintain such a sleepless vigil for centuries. It's thick layers of dust settling upon their reptilian forms. Yet the ever watchful guardians are not immobile statues and can erupt in sudden violence should they perceive any threat to their charges. Even skink priests and other attendants of this land approach with skittish caution, lest they, by some unintended move, 
invite the temple guard's heavy-handed response. Whenever a slain mage priest goes, his temple guard will follow. If the slan wishes to ascend a towering pyramid to retire to the solitary of a star chamber, his guardians will dutifully follow. The most powerful of their number, the revered guardian, takes the foremost position, no matter to the temple guard in the winds of magic blow so strongly that prismatic arcs of energy flash through the air, or if warming rays of solar engine bask the area in the intense heat, they are beyond distraction. If their temple city is threatened or a sacred object they were tasked with guarding is stolen, the temple guard will attack their foe relentlessly, pursuing until the threat is over or the object returned before returning to their silent vigil. So this land mage priest go to war, his temple guard go with him, often forming up around their master, shielding him from their own tough, scaled bodies and interlocking their shields. Heedless of their own casualties, the temple guard execute their sacred duty until the enemy is annihilated or themselves are slain, essentially meaning they are unbreakable. There is a strict hierarchy amongst the temple guard. The youngest spawnings are tasked with the protection of places of power. Great constructions that are rarely graced with the presence of a slan, but are still of sacred significance. Older, tougher, and more proven temple guard are sent to watch the outer limits and lesser pyramids of their own city, while the most ancient protect the great temples and the many plaques and relics kept within the crypts themselves. When not protecting their charges in battle, each of these Saras attend to a specific duty. The Stone Warden guards the Slan's palaquin chamber. The Sentinel of the Blessed is responsible for the safety of the Temple Skink attendants. The Relic Keeper stands sentry in the Temple City vaults, watching over the treasure so valued by warm blooded thieves. Whilst the Mortuary Custodian guards the most sacred relics of all, deep within the Pyramid's tomb chamber, the Relic Priests. The revered guardian, inevitably the strongest and most savage of the temple guard, stands sentry at the very entrance to the inner sanctum of the slant itself. It is the revered guardian, sometimes called the master of the twenty-two, who leads the temple guard in battle, and it is he alone who can grant access to the slant mage priest. Highest ranked of all is the eternity warden, who stands at his master's side, locked inside the star chamber as the slant casts his mind to the furthest reaches of the universe. Now, as you can see, the Temple Guard are not simply veteran Saurus warriors like you would assume, but much like the Chameleon Skinks, they are their own spawnings. Now, unlike in Tabletop, we got a more elite version of Temple Guard, in my opinion. In Tabletop, Temple Guard only have access to their halberds. However, in Total War, Temple Guard have access to halberds and shields simultaneously. This makes them not only excellent at taking down heavily armored large units, but also able to withstand skirmishing fire which means you could use them as frontline troops if they weren't so expensive, but regardless they are the elite of the already elite Lizardman infantry roster and should not be underestimated. And that ends it for our standard infantry, so now we move into the only monstrous infantry we have, the Croxigor. They are one of the core species of the Lizardman race, created by the Old Ones as strongness and obedient construction workers, laborers, and in times of war, powerful warriors. In all practicality, the Croxicor are essentially a larger and far more powerful relative of the Saras. They are hulking creatures, their bodies consisting of slabs of rock-hard muscle and their massive jaws bristling with razor-sharp teeth. They move in silence, save for the heavy thumping tread of their feet. When enraged, they unleash their only form of speech, a blood-curdling roar that reverberates across the jungle. Under the guidance of Skink Overseers, the Croxicor accomplish many great tasks that would require a great amount of strength to muster, such as hauling and placing the massive stone blocks instrumental in the composition of the Ziggurat temples. Perhaps due to their tedium of their labors, the Croxicor were never intended to be mentally agile. They are extremely simple-minded creatures that require and often desire direction and would instinctively obey all instructions from their smaller kin with an almost alien level of obedience. An infrequent spawning, it is rare for more than a handful of Croxigore to enter the world at the same time. They emerge from the same spawning pools as the Skinks, which may go to explain why the two species share another common affinity. Like Skinks, Croxigores are very at home in the water, able to move at speed through waterways or swamps. As they continue to develop, these lizards can grow to so large that they can rival even the mighty Carnosaur in sheer size, aggression, and stubbornness. Between tasks, Croxigor prefer to submerge themselves in water holes, leaving only the tops of their heads visible. In this way, not only do the beasts cool off, but they have a chance of surprising their next meal, 
when not geared towards warfare, the Croxicores provide an essential and vital role alongside their smaller skink cousins. During times of peace and massive construction work, the skinks, due to their frail and small stature, are unable to complete tasks that require extreme strength to accomplish. Instead, when not using massive beasts of burden to haul heavy goods and materials into place, the Croxicores are often the medium between the weaker skinks and the larger yet dull-witted lizard beasts able to understand orders far better than most jungle creatures. The Croxigores are often assigned the task of laboring heavy equipment or goods anywhere that their smaller skink relatives might have need of them. During times of war, however, units of Croxigore are used as shock troops to batter enemy battle lines. Croxigore do not always fight by themselves, however. Skinks tend to swarm around the Croxigore. Encouraged by the awesome power of these mighty creatures, they form up around the trunk of their legs, and which tower above them. For their part, the Croxigore are likewise attracted to masses of skinks, as their high-pitched sounds and energetic movements stimulate their own energy and fuel their own battle rage. In combat, such formations prove unusually effective, with the skinks able to pepper foes with poison-tipped javelins before crashing headlong into combat. There, the skinks provide innumerable fast jabs and their skittish natures, and curtailed somewhat by the large presence amongst them. In turn, they are backed up by the crushing power provided by the mighty Croxigore. Because of their massive frames, the Croxigore can easily reach over an intervening skinks, allowing the reptile's giants to pulp more than their share of any foe. Rock Croxigore are quite able to rip a man apart with their bare hands to enhance their destructive potential. Skinks will supply them with weapons. Each ornate club is taller than a Saurus and requires a dozen skinks to lift. The Croxigore swing these massive death dealing instruments with ease, able to splatter a man sized creature beyond recognition with a weighty blow that can shatter stone. Once the fighting is stopped, however, it is not uncommon for Croxigores to simply drop their weapons and continue on with another task they were pointed to. They were not made for remembering details for any length of time, and for this reason, some skinks will secure their weapons to the Croxigore itself using lengths of bronze chain. Even the most forgetful beast will therefore drag his weapon along behind him to the next engagement. Unfortunately, unlike in Tabletop, our version of Croxigores in Total War are not a mixed skink unit, I really wish they were, but they do function as line breakers and make excellent flankers as they do also cause fear. But for all purposes, they are nearly identical to trolls, except that they can go berserk and have a slightly better leadership. And now we move on to Lizardman Cavalry, starting with the Cold One Riders, or Cold One Cavalry, which are a specialized spawn of Saurus warriors that were ingrained with the ability to ride the unattainable Cold Ones into combat. Saurus warriors are formidable fighters, but when mounted atop a Cold One, they become a shock force capable of delivering an absolute mauling. These foes who can muster the courage to stand before the sight of uncommon Cold One Riders find themselves beset by a whirlwind of biting jaws, slashing talons, and jabbing spear thrusts. Saurus warriors blessed by Itzel have an innate aptitude for mounted warfare. They exude a musk not dissimilar to the rank odor produced by the Cold Ones themselves, allowing them to form bonds with the otherwise hostile creatures. The Saurus have claws that are perfect for gripping the thick scaled hide of the reptilian steed, leaving them free to carry both spear and shield. All such spawnings produce a pack leader who, insti who instinctively leads the group, knowing where to find the Cold Ones and how best to break them into mounts. Now, Cold Ones are still quite savage mounts, and much like Dark Elves, the Saurus also have a hard time keeping their mounts from rampaging, and this is also true in Total War. However, unlike in Tabletop, we get two variants of Cold Ones, ones with spears and shield, and one with cudgels and shields. Now. The cudgels are obviously for taking on infantry, and the other are for taking on cavalry and monsters. Each have a very specific task. And then we have the Horned Ones, which are an extremely rare, virtually extinct, and prenatarily swift subspecies of Cold One. Spawned in the same pool at the same time as those who will ride them into battle, they only exist in Lustria. It ventures out of the caverns into the jungle, which is probably why it is almost extinct. The Horned Ones are very aggressive and territorial, and will tackle virtually any other monster, regardless of its size. The Horned Ones are naturally adapted for fighting duels and have large horns and spiny crests growing out of their heads. Unlike other Cold Ones, Horned Ones are not easily manipulated to change their targets as they are always enraged by the smell of other creatures invading their territory. 
A horned one therefore behaves like a cold one, which has already tasted blood and is eager to fight. The bellowing of the horned one inflicts other cold ones with some aggression, sealing them against manipulation as well. Now, it took quite some digging to actually find this older lore, and I'm happy to see that CA is digging deep for units, and in game they are the elite heavy cav that the lizardmen were missing. Though they seem to specifically be designed as to not go berserk, that seems to be their only thing that they're really good at, which honestly kind of conflicts with the lore, but it works in game, so it works for me. And then we have the Pterodon Riders, which are a mighty and fast moving force of scouts and aerial warriors that have patrolled the skies above the Lustrian Empire for centuries. Only the Skinks have mastered the art of riding the fearsome Pterodons in battle by capturing Pterodon hatchlings at such an early age that the beasts would eventually bond with their future riders. No easy matter considering the height and precariousness of Pterodon layers. There's a great demand for these Pterodon riders as messengers and scouts, and they are exceptionally useful in battle. There, they streak ahead of the main lizardmen force, the skinks clinging to the flying reptiles' backs, launching poison-tipped javelins or slinging deadly fire leech bolas. Veteran riders, known as sky leaders, know how to harass larger units, whittling them down to size before flying into combat to finish them off. Pterodons are known to snatch eggs from their nest layers, or any number of Lustria's gigantic creatures. Some of the eggs bear shells too, so thick that even determined sledgehammer blows can break them. This does not stop the pterodon, however, as it simply grasps the egg with its talons and soars high, dropping it to shatter below. The skinks have exploited this instinct in battle by training their pterodons to glide over the enemy while clutching a rock in their talons. From far above, the skink riders will survey the battlefield and choose a target. On the skink signal, the pterodon will release its burden. With the momentum of its fall, a single such boulder can cause horrific damage, but an entire unit can unload a barrage, a veritable avalanche of death from the sky that wreaks blood splatter devastation upon the foe. The skinks have improved the accuracy of these natural bombs by installing chains into specifically crafted spheres of masonry, which are easier for the pterodons to grip and are inscribed with ancient glyphs of fortune and devastation. Now, all flying units are fast, but pterodon riders are extremely fast and also quite more dangerous than the flying units from other rosters. In Total War, we get the standard version that has the rider flinging the standard javelin, as well as dropping a single boulder atop the enemy's heads. And we also get the Fire Leech Bola version, which obviously does fire damage and deals with unarmored targets extremely well. But their low armor does mean that they need to stay away from skirmishers and do their best to never get caught by any kind of flying melee unit. Even fell bats will do significant damage to Pterodon Riders. And then we have the Ripple Dactyl Rider. They are amongst the greatest and most fearsome aerial warriors to ever soar across the skies of tropical Lustria. Through skinks found training Pterodons relatively easily, turning Ripper Dactyls into Sky Mounts proved a far more difficult task. While sustaining many losses, Skinks learned that hatched Ripper Dactyls could not be trained. Even stolen eggs were problematic, as upon cracking its shell, the claw-winged creature instead attacked the first thing it saw. If the Skink survived, there was a chance the beast might bond to him, although such things took much time and many scars. After about a year, if the Ripper Dactyl had not yet eaten the Skink, it accepted him as its master. Now, the Skinks who survive bonding with Ripper Dactyl are very bold warriors the most elite of their small kind. Once mounted atop a Ripper Dactyl, the, they forego javelins and blowpipes, for the blood-hungry beast that they ride cannot be stopped from plunging down upon foes. Instead, they arm for close combat, donning ceremonial helmets and carrying shields and long spears. Led by their bravery, each Ripper Dactyl rider fights with aggressive skill, but they pale in comparison to their mount. The razor-sharp talons of a Ripper Dactyl can decapitate foes, their fierce attacks often leaving a ring of strewn innards and lopped off limbs behind them. Although Ripperdactyls are merciless killers, eager to devour anything that moves, there is one foe that they target above all others. The Lustria Blot Toad, the largest member of the Barking Toad family, is a noxious beast known to invade the cliffside layers of Ripperdactyls. Even a single such toad produces an odor almost unendurable to cold-blooded creatures. When gathered in numbers, they release enough foul swamp gas to drive off a hungry carnosaur. For reasons unknown, the favorite food of blot toads is Ripperdactyl eggs. Naturally, Ripperdactyl seek out such beasts, destroying any they find with extreme prejudice. Skinks have learned that by covertly painting a single such toad upon an enemy unit, the diminutive riders can target 
who was most likely to bear the brunt of the Ripperdactyl Screeching Fury. Unfortunately, we did not get Ripperdactyls in the standard release of Total War, but I do have high hopes that they may be added at a later date as DLC, as they would fill a more aggressive, tough flying role that the Lizardmen currently are missing. And now we are finally to the War Beasts. I know this is going to be a long video, guys. Strap in. So the first is the Jungle Swarm. And it is essentially just a whole bunch of snakes and lizards and toads that envelop an enemy. They are basically a tar pit to distract troops and since I highly doubt they will ever be added as no other swarm unit has been added as well, I'm going to politely skip over them, they're not very interesting, and move on to Stegodons which roam throughout the Lustrian continent and herds ranging in size from a handful of related beasts to great migrations of many thousands. Some of these groupings have distinct colors and markings such as the tan striped beasts that dominate the cracked earth of the Wuhan deserts, or the green spotted stegodons that live in the hidden Wangi Valley. Stegodons will feed upon almost anything they come across, devouring lush vegetation or the flesh of any creature foolish enough to get in their way. It takes great quantities of food to sustain such a behemoth, and they grow so large and heavy that their footsteps have been known to split stone into pebbles and tree trunks into splinters. Most stegodons, however, vary in coloration, ranging from pale blue grays to rich greens, browns, and reds. And the bony plates that coerce their thick hides age, they become much harder as well as lighter in color. The unstegodons can be quite brightly colored, and those within a few decades of having hatched are often heavily mottled or otherwise camouflaged. As the monstrous reptiles grow older, they usually lose some of these contrasting patterns and become more evenly colored. There is not always the case, however, as shown by the brilliant diamond-backed patterns exhibited by some stegodons of the piranha swamps, notorious beasts that can wallow in the deepest swamp channels where they lie hidden in ambush. Older stegodons, particularly the largest bulls, leave their herds and strike out on their own. Such rogues establish farther ranging territories and challenge any of their kind that dares trespass. These head clashing bouts can last for days and can flatten swaths of jungle. It is not unknown for striking and colorful markings to appear on the crest of these elder beasts, signaling that they are the most powerful of their kind. Since the earliest days, the lizardmen have used Segadons as beasts of burden, to smash roadways through the jungle and to drag huge blocks of stone to build temples. They are also used by devastating shock attacks in times of war and to add serious fighting heft to far-ranging ground patrols. These creatures are reared by teams of skinks who stay with them throughout their lifetimes, and the stegodons grow to become very protective of those skinks they have known since the days as a hatchling. Large howdahs are attached to the beast's back, and from this protected vantage point, the skinks can hurl a storm of poison-tipped javelins in battle and fire huge arrows from the mounted great bows known to the skinks as Sotek's Curse. On the attack, a Stegodon lowers its horned head and charges into combat. For all its awesome bulk, the Stegodon's short but powerful legs can drive it forward at such a pace that its momentum is nothing short of devastating. Foes not slain outright by impact of its charge are crushed to bloody pulps by sheer bulk or speared upon the ends of one of the Stegodon's imposing spikes. Now, there is one more further variant of Stegodon. We then have the ancient Stegodons, which are amongst the largest and most ferocious of their entire race. The eldest Stegodons have grown yet thicker hides, larger horns, and tower above even their own pack. Over the ages, some of their fiery temper has cooled, and as they often outlive their skink crews, they gradually become more accepting of newer handlers. Each new team honors the beast, and the elder Stegodons are widely venerated. Many crews will hammer bronze or gold plates covered with glyphs into the gnarled hides more to mark a beast's status than to provide additional protection. Likewise, on the eldest of beasts, reinforced max are set over the creature's head crest, and ornamental bracelets or sharp metal tips commonly seen to cover the creature's impressive array of horns. Ancient stegodons frequently carry fearsome blowpipes in the fighting howdahs. Each fires a cluster of darts that separates in flight to create a hail of poison death. It is good reason that the skinks name these fearsome weapons Sotek Sting. The most revered of ancient stegodons are just to have sufficient strength and the right temperament to carry the archaic artifacts known as the Engine of the Gods. If the Lizardmen have, have ever the knowledge to how these ancient wonders worked, they lost it long ago. However, they do know how to activate them. When the glyphs are touched in the right order, the device thrums with arcane energies. 
The Engine of the Gods has mysterious powers that can protect nearby lizardmen or send rays to smite their foes. Even the Winds of Magic can be better siphoned to aid the casting of spells in the presence of such a potent apparatus. Only a handful of the engines exist, and they are hidden away in temple vaults and only rarely brought forth. They often serve as war mounts for skink priests or great importance, and are used to anchor a battle line. The first to utilize the Engine of the Gods was Tenawan, the prophet of Sotek, at the height of the Siege of Quetzal. Tenawan led his disciples into the surrounding jungle. They returned three days later, the entire group riding upon ancient stegodons that bore Engines of the Gods, and used them to destroy the Skaven. Since that time, the Engine of the Gods have been brought forth only when they are needed most. For each is an instrument of the Old One's power, and the loss of a single one might irredeemably jeopardize the great plan of the Lizardmen's long-gone creator gods. And as you can tell, Stegodons are very powerful, essentially siege beasts. We get a feral version, which is powerful but can rampage out of control, the standard Stegodon with an essentially bolt thrower on its back, and the ancient Stegodon with the incredible blanket poison dart death dealing potential as it rolls through enemy troops. And then we move on to the Bastilodon, sometimes known as Living Bastions, are a mighty and hulking species of armored reptiles whose heavily armored shell is perhaps one of the strongest within the continent of Lustria. It is a walking fortress, a living bastion covered in rock-hard bony skin, then further protected by massive iron-like plates, a natural armor so dense that it can sometimes thwart the bite of the mighty Carnosaur. Even those blows that crack the outermost armor plates cannot penetrate deeply into the beast due to the Bastilodon's alternating layers of thick leathery skin and additional scales. Because of its high, impenetrable armor, there are few predators in Lustria that will dare attack a Bastilodon. Such formidable protection, however, does not come at a cost, for the Bastilodon is a lumbering and ponderous creature. Slowed down by its own dense weight, the largest threat to a Bastilodon comes not from prowling gargantuan carnivores, but rather the quicksand and boggy mud that can be found throughout the steamy jungles. Even on solid ground, the heavy tread of the armored beast leaves deep prints, and should one wander too deeply into a swampy area, it can all too easily become hopelessly mired. This is exactly how the skinks have come to trap Bastilodons, using all their wits to subjugate and then train the beasts. When ridden to war, the Bastilodon carry with them some of the treasured weapons of the temple cities. Their incredibly thick and armored hides allow them to carry devices which other beasts, even the revered Stegodon, steadfastly refuse. These revered and holy objects are mounted upon the great beast's back so that they might be activated to smite any who dare set foot in sacred Lustria. For example, the Ark of Sotek, or Twin-Headed Ark, is a device that was first used in the Skaven Wars by the Order of Tenawan himself. It is a sacred stone artifact lifted upon the Bastilodon's armored back. In appearance, it is a stone basin engraved with symbols venerating Sotek. As the Bastilodon pounds towards its enemies, the skink crew activate these glyphs and perhaps most importantly, rake the coals beneath. From out of the Ark's sacred confines pour forth an endless supply of serpents, blessed by Sotek, or at least enraged by the heat, and eager to attack the nearest foe. While some beasts would, understandably, balk at the multitude of snakes, it is the red-hot coals that cause creatures to refuse to carry this device. Such is the thickness of the Bastilodon's armor, however, that it does not even notice the blazing fires stoked on its very own back. Now, like many Lizardman devices, the apparatus at first seems to be quite simple, but the magic is twofold. Firstly, by Sotek's blessings, the enraged serpents swarm out and strike at those nearby. Yet miraculously, the snakes only ever attack the enemies of the Lizardmen. The second inexplicable thing, although very few foes ever live long enough to realize it, is that the Ark never runs out of snakes. Whether they are summoned from the surrounding flora or created by Eldritch means is irrelevant. The serpents continue to issue forth like water from a well. So many vipers, asps, and snakes of all kinds writhe near the Ark that those swarms of diminutive reptiles accompanying the Lizardmen army grow even larger in its presence. The eldritch and inexplicable artifact known as the Solar Engine is taken from its secure chamber from beneath the confines of the Pyramid Temple and maneuvered into a Bastilodon's carapace. Skink priests declare that the Bastilodon is favored by Chotek, the Lord of the Sun, and that this creature alone is worthy to carry the Solar Engine. Whether this is true, or if the Hori Bastilodon is simply the only jungle creature that will bear the superheated heated device upon its back, is unknown. 
When activated, the arcane machine radiates invigorating rays that stirs nearby reptilian creatures to energetic new heights of action and violence. When the attending skin crew intone the correct blessings of Chotek, the solar engine also blasts forth a beam of intense heat, which burns the foe like the condensed rays of the sun itself. Now, we do get the Pharaoh Basilidon, which has an enormous health pool, and can still go berserk, but it's kind of unique and interesting variants of this Dylan that really sell them as far as Siege Beast. The first is the Solar Engine, which we just mentioned. It shoots a concentrated beam of sunlight to a devastating effect, and the CA-inspired Revivification Crystal, I think I'm saying that right, which, only, which not only rejuvenates the health of your units, but also can resurrect them from the dead, is a very interesting and useful weapon, as it is one of the few ways the Lizardmen can recover units in the field as of right now. For some reason, they don't have access to any magics that heal units, even though they should have access to every magic, but that's a different point entirely. Now, as for the Ark of Sotek, I see this being added in a DLC, specifically focused on the Prophet of Sotek. But it is my opinion that if it is added, it won't spill out little swarms of snakes, but essentially exude either a poisonous aura or damage nearby enemies, kind of like the uh, Mortis engine of the Vampire Counts. Except it would be heavily armored and much harder to deal with, but slow. And then we have the Carnosaurs, which are a large apex predator that has terrorized the darkness of the primordial jungle since the dawn of this world's existence. Considered by many as the ultimate jungle hunter, with some growing nearly two stories tall, these massive reptilian beasts are powerfully built and highly aggressive creatures. With long muscular hind limbs and a heavy tail that is used to balance its enlarged and powerful skull, only the dread Sardian are above even these mighty predators. Upon scenting prey or catching sight of even the slightest amount of movement, the carnosaur propels itself with enormous strides, moving with a surprising speed for such a large beast. Their shortened forelimbs and sharp claws are ideal for locking hold of prey allowing the Carnosaur to better line up its most destructive attack. Carnosaurs have massive jaws, with gaping mouths filled with dagger-like teeth. Their bite can hack through huge chunks of flesh on larger prey, and by twisting its th thick serpentine neck, a Carnosaur can simply rip its quarry apart, piece by bloody piece. Having tasted blood, the Carnosaur is at its most deadly, for it enters a state of savage bloodlust biting the tear at any living creature, sometimes slaughtering its gory way through entire herds of giant reptilians without pause. Such is what they were bred to become, for the primordial jungles of Lustria only spares the strongest and most ferocious of monsters, while the weak are simply left to be eaten by those seeking to consume flesh. Only the most powerful Saurus warriors can ride these bloodthirsty behemoths into battle, and it's said, much skill and strength to keep the beast under control, much less being able to simply hold on when the beast goes into a blood frenzy, this is simply due to the beast's own extreme will. Carnosaurs are far from dull-witted creatures, and it takes a great force of will to dominate them into submission. With a Saurus Old Blood or Scar Veteran on its back, a Carnosaur is able to wade through the enemy battle lines, a death-dealing colossus that can shatter an army's resolve to fight in a bl few bloody moments. It takes much strength and skill to keep such a willful beast under control, yet even that symbolism of mastery is shed in the heat of battle as soon as the Carnosaur tastes blood. When the vicious killing furies upon a Carnosaur, it will likely revert to its instincts, the apex predator of a deadly land, charging and devouring any creature in its sight, and so much as moves. Now, we do get the mighty Carnosaur as a feral standalone unit, and it is anti-large, but will often go berserk, but the true use of them is, as I just stated, as mounts for generals and heroes. And when a lizardman is atop them, the havoc they can wreak across a battlefield is glorious. As well as being relatively quick for such a large unit, they make an excellent mount for your general. Now, there are three more monster units that did not make the cut, unfortunately. But we will still get into them just in case they're ever added. Now the first are the salamanders, which are giant predatory reptiles that stalk the swamplands and estuaries of the illustrian jungles. Propelled by four thickly muscled legs and a powerful tail, they are swift moving creatures, whether on land or in water. Salamanders are voracious hunters, and their favorite method of catching prey is to swiftly close the distance, moving through underbrush or even submerged underwater. Once within range, they launch a burst of highly corrosive liquid from their gullets, 
a substance so volatile that it bursts into flames upon contact with the air. The burning pitch-like substance sticks to victims, burning them alive while already beginning the digestive process. The creature's neck frills and back cells provided a cooling mechanism ensuring the cold-blooded creature does not expire from the heat generated from its own body. It is difficult to catch and train a salamander, but skinks known as handlers manage to do so. Using sharp tip jabbing spears, skink handlers goat salamanders into position and then prod them until they are angry enough to spit flames. Although sometimes employed by skink artisans to fire kilns, the salamanders are most often used in warfare. Poking a beast as violent as a salamander is a very hazardous task, and over the course of their duties, many skink handlers are eaten or covered in flaming bile themselves. On the battlefield, salamander hunting packs often cover the army's flanks. Skink handlers attempt to move these beasts into a clear firing position, a difficult task as the salamanders often wish to charge straight forward into combat, and if the handlers line it up correctly, they can coerce a, ca a salamander to spout its flame upon the foe before allowing the creature to finish the job with tooth and claw. Skinks have learned that salamanders are particularly effective at burning foes out of fortifications. The burning liquid splashes through embouchures to burn alive any within. So where the wooden palisades of the Norse colonies destroyed and defenders removed from the towers of the beached bleak black ark, the umbral tide. I thought that the salamander was going to be a shoe in for Total War. It is a rather iconic lizardman unit and it fills a gap very much lacking in their army. The lizardmen honestly don't have a good skirmisher outside of the pterodons and the salamanders give a good high damage relatively armored skirmishing unit to them with a limited range of course but unlike the skinks the salamanders will literally melt enemy units and honestly i just want to see it as the existing flamethrower-esque units currently in the game are by far my favorites and on to the razor dons which are a species of thorny predator reptiles whose whole body is covered with an array of large barbed spines hardened spikes made of bone that project menacingly out of their bodies as a defensive protection the razor shop body armor serves to deter all but the most determined of creatures, and even of the most monstrous of lustrous many apex predators will think twice before attacking a razor dawn. The razor dawn spines are not only a deterrent, however, as they are a deadly offensive weapon. By way of powerful muscle spasms, razor dawns can discharge their spines, shooting them outwards in a deadly hail. Razor dawns are most commonly found in swampy regions or tidal bastions and more of their number are concentrated around the, the Amazon Basin than anywhere else in Lustria. There in the overgrown backwaters, they favor prey of razor dons can be found in great profusion. Razor dons feed on any of the enormous winged insects and plagues the moist east swampy air and the droning clouds so dense that they blot out the noonday sun. Without wings, it is not easy to hunt such a quick flying quarry, but the razor don has developed its own unique way. It first slinks within range by crouching low and advances through the high rushes, or by submerging itself in the water so that only its eyes and nostrils poke above the floating algae of the Foton Marshes. When a good-sized insect drones by, the Razor Dawn will fire a volley of its spikes into the air, hoping to impel and bring down its prey. Even crippling its target is enough to bring it near the ground, where the Razor Dawn's long claws and ragged sharp teeth are even more than enough to finish off an insect, no matter how large. While any of the plethora of insect types will do, all Razorons consider the horn-sized stega wasps or blood-draining saber flies special delicacies. How we know this, I'm not sure. In much the same manner as the salamander, skinks capture and train Razorons through the spiky beast have no domestic uses and are used exclusively on patrols or at war. Goading such a creature to shoot its darts is relatively simple, if somewhat risky, task, and the skink handlers prod the razor dawn with the sharp end of a spear and then duck. As razor dons are mean, spirited creatures, it is not unusual for an occasional dart to be fired towards the skink handlers rather than the targets they would have chosen. The lizardmen use razor dons as living pieces of artillery, driving them towards enemy battle lines, all the while encouraging the beast to fire a steady rain of spines in enemy ranks. A single dart can be deadly as it is shot out with enough force to splinter a shield or punch a hole clean through a man's body. However, even a creature that is hit by razor dawn spikes and survives is still in danger. Each spine has tiny barbs that ensure that pulling it out inflicts even greater injury and loss of blood. 
should a foe be so foolhardy as to charge a Razor Dawn, the spiky reptile has developed a fearsomely devastating reaction, flexing its scaling hide to blast forth a formidable volley. Those attackers, fortunate enough to make it past the wall of darts fired at them, find themselves met by the snarling Razor Dawn. During the Battle of the Lost Plaque at La Croissant, Razor Dawn hunting packs were massed together in a large formation and managed to stop cold a formation of charging Bretonian knights, slaughtering them to a man. Now, the Razor Dawns are very similar in the way the ancient Stegodons work in Total War, and for that reason, I kind of see why they weren't included. However, to me at least, I see them as a much smaller and therefore cheaper version, and perhaps maybe they will make it as DLC one day. And finally, we have the last of the Lizardmen units in the Troglodon. Known as the Pale Death by those that face them, or amongst one of Lustria's deadliest hunters. Named after their troglodyte existence, troglodons spend most of their lives haunting subterranean grottos that crisscross the length of the continent, emerging only to hunt and feast on prey. These creatures are virtually blind, but hunt using senses other than sight. Swaying sinuously, the troglodon uses its quill, like whiskers, to track motion, while its forked tongue tastes the air. Upon locating its target, the troglodon springs and bites, savaging its quarry with jaws full of hollow teeth, able to pump forth noxious venom. The predator is known to spit this toxic bile, which helps the troglodon triangulate their victim's location, as the fluid makes a distinctive sizzling sound as it sears flesh. Skink priests claim that the twin-tailed beasts are marked by the old ones, the serpent's god Sotek, or perhaps both. The ferocious creatures are untamable, and all who approach a troglodon provoke a lethal attack, with one exception. A skink oracle, a lone skink spawned with a forked tail, can instantly tame the pale death, often adorning it with gems or precious metals to show its sacred status. The troglodon deigns to serve as a mount for the tiny oracle and once bound into its service, the loathsome beast will never abandon its master. Mounted on a troglodon, a skink oracle travels the land, using his obscure divining powers to seek out lost artifacts of the old ones or to investigate disturbances felt in the geomantic web. As with the Skink Priest, Slan Mage Priest can see the world through the eyes of a Skink Oracle and can cast spells through them. This telepathic link means the oracles often appear just when they are needed most, further adding to the superstitious surrounding the mysterious Skinks and their revered mouths. All Lizardmen rally at the wailing cry of the Troglodon, for its eerie call stirs the savagery and proves that they have the Old One's favor. Now, the Troglodon is a rather odd unit. It is rather huge and only a skink oracle can write it. Now, I do in fact possibly see this unit being added if they do a Prophet of Sotek DLC. As much like the Goblin War Boss, a skink, skink oracle could be our stand-in for a skink general. Decent in melee and access to a few spells, well, maybe not as powerful as a priest, but kind of a hybrid that buffs skinks, which definitely, the skinks need a buffing. They're all but useless right now. And that is it for the Lizardman units. So let's go into tactics. Now I will keep this relatively brief since this video is much longer than I intended it to be. And for that reason, the Lizardman army can be wielded in a few different ways. It is not as flexible as some races, but it is rather unique. The majority of the army is focused on melee combat. And I would liken Lizardman tactics to a steamroller. They are the army that runs headlong to the enemy, with the occasional flank from heavy cav and bombardments from pterodons. They simply push through the front line, through ferocity and mass, as their monsters can be slowed by very little once they enter an engagement. However, if the enemy line can hold, most of the Lizardman army is at a complete loss, and they are extremely weak to factions that can skirmish well, especially that have armor-piercing missiles, like the Dark Elves. To make up for this, they have access to the most powerful spellcasters, which is ironic as they appear to be one of the most savage races in Warhammer, but nevertheless the goal of a Lizardman army is to outperform in melee and crush flanks despite massive casualties, as they don't spook easily. This makes them especially dangerous to factions that have few ranged options or anti-large, meaning vampire counts and in particular chaos, as they appear to be perfect at taking out mass quantities of melee infantry and don't have much of a problem with armor piercing. For this reason, Chaos Warriors do not fare well as they usually rely on their thick armor and overall physical superiority over the other factions to carry the day. 
but they cannot do the same thing against the Lizardmen, as they have some of the most elite infantry in Warhammer, and the monsters that specialize in combating other monsters, as well as mass infantry. Overall, the Lizardmen are the unstoppable juggernaut that plows through the enemy front line and collapses it upon itself. Now, you can play them defensively with the li very limited artillery they have, but primarily that's just to goad someone out of their defensive positions. You can't bombard them like you could a Dwarven army, for instance. So, there is that. And with that, we have finally covered the Lizardman roster, at least all the units to my knowledge. Now, if you have questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section or post them in my Q&A video, and I will do my best to fit them in. I do make mistakes from time to time, so feel free to correct me if I've missed anything. And I would like to say thank you to all of my new followers. We just hit a little over 500 subscribers. That's kind of a big deal for me and for the channel. And for your patronage, and of course to my loyal subscribers for sticking with me for all of this time. I have much more and more planned, and as long as you guys are enjoying the content, I will continue to make it. As always, I have been Jumbo Thick. Thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Have a good day.